Uh, our topic today is um, Islam between religious ideality and social reality. Because this is what we're living between. A very clear, detailed religious ideality and a very blatant, uh, in-your-face social reality. We have to live between those parameters. And when I um, listen to lectures on YouTube uh, and um, beautiful comments on WhatsApp and Facebook by the scholars and the leaders and the students of knowledge and the lay people, uh, we hear a lot of very beautiful religious ideology. You know, we hear a lot of beautiful recitation of Quran. So many um, uh, presentations of uh, adhkar, you know, different types of supplications to make. Um, explanations and presentations of the ahadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, his seerah. Um, answers to questions of jurisprudence. Clarification about issues of our aqidah, you know, our issues of our belief. We hear so many very beautiful, religiously correct uh, presentations on Facebook, on YouTube, on Instagram, on WhatsApp, so forth and so on. And may Allah bless and increase knowledge and his barakah to all the people who are engaged in uh, feeding us uh, with this uh, religious ideology. However, very seldom do I hear from the same scholars, students of knowledge, religious people, and leaders, and lay people, those who have an opinion, very seldom do I hear them give very clear, practical, solid, beneficial, presentations about our social reality. Now that happens to be uh, the dichotomy that we are witnessing in the world that we live in today. And when I say the world we live in today, I mean the Muslim world and the other uh, human beings who live in the various countries and societies of the world that we're living in. So, here I would just like to ask about seven questions. And I'm not going to answer these questions. Uh, we, we, it, it will take some time to answer these questions for those who are willing to answer them. Now when I ask these questions, don't treat them as coming from Sheikh Khalid Yassin. So don't be answering me. Take the personality out of the picture. Take the subjectivity out of the picture. It is a question that each one of us, in the capacity that we hold, need to answer. Because when we get these answers, then we will be able to put things into context. Then we will be able to see the picture. So these are the, the seven questions. And... Uh, maybe some of you that are outside uh, because you are very intelligent or you are very intellectual or you are very religious or you are very concerned or informed, you might be able to add a few questions of your own. But for this sitting and this discussion, don't ask questions while I'm asking these questions. This is not your platform. 
So don't ask me questions while I'm asking the questions. Don't be so quick to respond to the questions. And I don't need your accolades. I don't need you to gas me up. Whether you like me or you don't like me, that's not the issue. I'm putting this forward as a nasiha to get some clarity, to arrive at some conclusions. So these are the questions. Number one, what happened to community leaders? I didn't say leaders in the mosques. I didn't say religious leaders. I didn't say scholars. I didn't say students of knowledge. I said, what happened to the community leaders? Because we are living as individuals, but we should become, we should be a part of a community. Not a religious community, not an ideological community, but a community of people who are living together in a certain specific area, who are sharing a similar social experience, who are relying upon the same social institutions and who should come together uh, attached to a leader who becomes responsible and accountable for their lives. So the question is, what happened to community leaders? And let's keep in mind when we say community, we don't mean a masjid. You know, the group of people who come to a masjid form the part of a congregation. We're not talking about congregation in a mosque. We're talking about the leader. We're talking about a community by the definition which was given. And a leader, a representative who is regarded as the leader or the focal point or the person responsible for this group of people who are under this disciplined definition. Next, what happened to the concept of community? You know, there's the masjid. There's the ideological people who are following a scholar or who are following an imam or who are following a student of knowledge or who subscribe to classes and seminars and conferences and so forth and so on. But what happened to the concept of community? A group of people, their families, their extended relatives, their neighbors, their co-workers, who live in a specific area in a particular society, sharing similar institutions, experiences, who are connected to an individual, who they are responsible towards and he becomes accountable to them. You know, in my country, the United States of America, there are approximately 5,600 masajids, masjids, Islamic centers. But I'm not talking about 5,600 Islamic centers. I didn't say what happened to them. We know where they are. I said what happened to the concept of jama'a. As it was understood in the Athar of Umar ibn Khattab, there is no Islam without jama'a. And no jama'a without an Amir. And no Amir except that he is obeyed. Now, for those who are um, religiously correct um, or more religiously correct than I am, and you want to uh, dissect this athar into whether it is appropriate or whether it is sound uh, and where it came from and how it can be used in the, um, the, 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 the Arabic idiom, uh, uh, the nahu and sarf attached to it and so forth and so on. That's for you to do. And if you don't want to accept that athar, accept the concept of it, because that concept and that discipline is a part of Islam, as demonstrated by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions and the tabi'een and the atba'a tabi'een. That concept and that discipline, it was present. 
And that's what yielded to us the phenomena of what we are following. So today, what happened to that concept? Next. How can we expect the lives of Muslims to be wholesome when they are nourished from just prayers, lectures, and rituals? If we take the lives of Muslims, um, if we take the lives of Muslims like we do our own lives, how would we expect our own lives, bodies, to be properly nourished if we are not eating the proper, ingesting the proper foods with the proper nutrients, how could we possibly maintain the health of our bodies? Similarly, the question is, how can we expect the lives of Muslims, wherever they are, to be wholesome, balanced, and productive when they are nourished from just prayers, lectures, and rituals. Because 90% of what we hear, 90% of what we see, 90% of what we experience as religion is simply prayers, lectures, and rituals. There are no mundane dynamics. Number four, where do we go? And whom do we rely upon for day to day and bread and butter issues? I said day to day and bread and butter. Now you don't have to be a rocket scientist to understand that question or that terminology. So obviously day to day doesn't mean going back and forth to the masjid for prayers. Day-to-day -day doesn't mean getting up for the Fajr and reading some Qur'an after that or going to Jum'ah and that day reciting Surah Al-Kahf. This is not what we mean by day-to-day. -day. And obviously, bread and butter means our life resources. Because most of what we are engaged in on a daily basis is our day-to-day -day and our bread and butter issues. So, whom do we go to? And where do we go? To receive the guidance and the information and leading us to the resources for our day to day and our bread to bread, bread to uh, our bread and butter issues. Now, don't answer this question. I'm, I'm telling you again, I'm asking you again. Don't be so smart. Don't be so uh, religious. Don't be so intellectual that you can just on the spot understand what I'm saying and answer it while I'm talking. That's uh, just uh, erratic. It's spontaneous. What I'm asking requires some thinking, some reflecting, and after that, some research, some uh, introspection, and then after that, a dignified response. Take Sheikh Khalid Yassin, the speaker, out of the picture. Remove the subjectivity of the personality. So don't personalize what I have to say. And if you can't see beyond my personality, or if you can't see beyond me and your subjective feeling about me, then just bow out. Go to another page. Say what's good or keep quiet. That's just my suggestion. I can't tell you what to do. Number five. If the religious people or leaders are in the mosque and our social reality is on the outside among the people, how do we reconcile this dichotomy? You know, the religious leaders and the mosque and the religious issues and the outside society and the realities of the social situation and the people, how do we reconcile these two dichotomies, these two extremes? Because at the end of the day, this is the maqasid of Islam. To take the religious ideality within the context of the social reality and to bring them together. 
This is the objective of Islam. Because at the end of the day, the objective of Islam is to cause social benefit. Said our Prophet Wasallam in so many words, when he was asked, who is the best among people? He said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَنْفُعُ النَّاسِ أو كما قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم He said, the best of the people are those who give the most benefit to the other people. So we need to bring the mosque and the religious people and the religious issues within context of the society and the people in the society and the realities of that society. We need to bring them together into a, uh, uh, a synergy. So my question again is, if the religious people or the leaders are in the mosque and our social reality is on the outside among the people, how do we reconcile that dichotomy? Number six, we are today oversaturated with the details of the halal and the haram. And we are reminded regularly about the signs of the last day. Subhanallah. You know, now that we have this social media, you know, everybody can sit down and pass on different information and everyone can sit down and take an ayah of Quran or a hadith of the Prophet Wasallam or some issue of fiqh or aqidah or whatever. Everyone can sit down and type it uh, and go to YouTube and select a particular video and then just send it out to people. And we can say 90% of what is being transferred, 90% of what is being transferred, transmitted, is issues dealing with halal and haram. Issues dealing with halal and haram. And issues dealing with reminders about the day of Qiyamah or the signs of the last day, which is profound. We don't want to trivialize the importance of that. And 90% of what we're getting is that. And now we're not just talking about the opinions of the lay people. We're not talking about their opinions and we're not talking about their rhetoric here. No, we're talking about the leaders, the speakers. You know, the religious people, what they have said and what we are passing on to others, most of it has to do with explanations about halal and haram. Reminders about the days, uh, the, uh, the signs of the last day. So, since we are oversaturated with the details of halal and haram and reminded constantly about the signs of the last day, my question is, what is the practical advice from our leaders about our day-to-day -day social challenges? Our day-to-day -day social challenges. And now, let me explain, if I might, what I mean by day-to-day -day social challenges. Because maybe, you know, we get lost in the sauce. You know, maybe you don't understand that terminology. So let me see if I might be able to be a little clearer about what I mean by that. You know, we hear that this is Sha'ban. You know, we do know that this is, this is the month of Sha'ban. And everyone is reminding each other. This is Sha'ban. You should make uh, this kind of adhkar or you should fast on these particular days and uh, you, you should be reminded about this and the excellence of, uh, of Sha'ban and so forth and so on. And this is ma'roof. This is well known. And we are told and we know that very soon Ramadan will be here. When we are in Sha'ban, we know the next month is Ramadan. And we need to prepare for the spiritual opportunity and the spiritual observation. So this is ma'ruf, we know this. And this is what we are being told. But between last Ramadan 
and this Ramadan. There were no milestones. There were no social milestones charted by our leaders. No real issues resolved by our leaders. And the state of the ummah was not articulated by the persons who claim to be the religious scholars, the students of knowledge, or the ones who themselves are considered to be leaders. Let me repeat that point. Between last Ramadan and this one, that's like one year, there were no social milestones charted. I didn't see any. I didn't see anything. I didn't see anything based upon city. I didn't see anything based upon region. I didn't see anything based upon country. And I didn't see anything based upon global dynamics. I didn't see it. Maybe somebody else, they saw it. Maybe somebody else, they wrote it. I didn't see any real issues. And we've already defined real by social reality. I didn't see any real issues resolved. Solutions arrived at. Articulated, packaged, passed on to the ummah so as to give them benefit and relief. I didn't see them. And lastly, I didn't see a group of scholars of a particular area, a particular city, a particular area, a particular region, a particular country, or if there is such a thing that exists, the scholars of the ummah collectively reach out make tawasa with each with one another and give nasiha to the ummah as an articulated state of the ummah i didn't read one so therefore the seventh question who wants to take the responsibility now this is a question for the leaders this is a question for the students of knowledge. This is a question for the scholars. This is a question for those who pontificate. Those who themselves, those who see themselves in the position to be advising the Muslims. Those who see themselves to be in the position of articulating the religious uh, correction or correctness. This is a question for the leaders. Not necessarily for those who are listening to this presentation now. So, my question is, and this is question number seven, who wants to take the responsibility for this social dysfunction? This social state of affairs. And we can go from the micro to the macro with this question. Next, who is willing to take the accountability for the traumas and the tragedies that Muslims are experiencing and enduring? Now, I mean that they are experiencing and enduring in this dunya, not what may happen to them later. Not what happens to them as they enter the Akhirah. Not what happens to them on the day of Qiyamah. I'm talking about the traumas and the tragedies that Muslims are experiencing in this dunya. Who wants to take the responsibility? And who is willing to be accountable? Where we are living. That means in the city where we live, in the state where we live, in the region where we live, in the country where we live, in this dunya, in this world that we live. Who wants to be accountable? Who wants to take the responsibility? Who wants to stand up and say, I am responsible and I will be accountable along with those I have reached out to who share responsibility in other places until we individually and collectively enter upon the Akhirah because 
Each one of us individually will enter upon our Akhirah when we die. That is understood by Akhirah. When you die or I die, we enter our Akhirah. The first stage of our Akhirah, we enter. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about before that. Until we individually and collectively enter upon our Akhirah, who is responsible and who is willing to take the accountability for the tragedies and the traumas that Muslims are experiencing and enduring all over the world and in the cities where we live. Dear brothers and sisters, this is your brother Sheikh Khalid Yassin and I'm just asking. I didn't tell much. I'm just asking. Now, it would be good for the leaders. You know, if the leaders are, uh, are not listening to this, they don't have to. Because I may be too small of a person for the leaders to listen to. Or for me to even be asking this kind of question. I may be too small of a stature of person. I may not be within their religious uh, hierarchy or their circle to ask this kind of question. However, our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Adin al nasiha The religion is advice and compliance. And when the companions, radiallahu anhum, asked him, advice and compliance to whom? He said, Lillah, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, Walil Rasulihi, Walil Kitabihi, Lillah, Walil Kitabihi, and to his book, the mandates of his book. Al-Quran. Walil Rasulihi and to the mandates and the procedures connected to his sunnah of his Prophet Sallallahu Muslimin and the leaders, the Imams and leaders of the Muslims him and the generality of them. So most who are listening to what I have had to say today who have heard these questions, we are part of the generality of the Muslims. But we have a right as the generality of the Muslims to ask the leaders the same questions. My suggestion for you is take this set of questions, send it to your leader as a video, or take your notes and send it to them in a written format or in audio format and in a very dignified, respectful way, present these questions and ask them to address these questions. Not to you, but to the generality of the Muslims. And don't say Sheikh Khalid Yassin said this. Don't personalize it because, you know, maybe uh, they will see me as uh, one of those names, one of those categories that, you know, the leaders of the Muslims, the students of, of the scholars and the religious people, they sometimes have a habit of putting people into pigeonholes, categories. And based upon that pigeonhole or that category or that particular persuasion, they determine whether or not that person should even be listened to. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. Wa qulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Subhanakallahum wa bihamdik. Wa nashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Wa nastaghfirukum wa natubu ilayk. Wa assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.